Um, we've been hosting similar conversations like this over the past years at our Sustainable Apparel and Textiles Conference um, at Innovation Forum, which some of you listening and attending might be familiar with. And we focus a lot on supply chain issues, but um, obviously looking at what happens after the consumer is uh, just as important. And it becomes a big topic in, in areas such as sustainable apparel, whereas as Innovation Forum, we work in a lot of different areas. So this is sort of like a fun topic to kind of see how we engage consumers better um, around sustainable apparel as well. Um, so how... Um, this topic, we've been discussing it at the conference for a few years, but over the past years, we've seen sort of rental resale platforms um, come to market, specifically looking at the immense waste issue. And I can assume that most of the people in this room are completely aware of the insane waste issue in the apparel industry. Um, but because I like statistics, <laughs> I'm going to um, say a few just to frame the discussion um, and put some onus onto all of this, but globally, an estimated 92 million tons of textile waste are created every year. Um, consumers are buying more pieces of clothing, but they're keeping them for half as long than they did 15 to 20 years ago. And I also saw a study recently that if people kept clothes for just an extra nine months, um, the overall footprint of the apparel industry could be reduced by 20 to 30 percent. Um, so in response to this, we've seen numerous resale, rental um, platforms come to market and brands themselves have been implementing them as well. I've been trying to set up this sort of session at our conferences, I remember four, five years ago, and it was quite nascent at the time, but we've seen it just explode. And the three panelists that I have with me today can, can attest to that. Um, so yeah, for the next hour, uh, you and I have the pleasure from hearing from various speakers, um, looking at different areas, um, like how Toast, Madeline is joining us from Toast, have integrated resale, um, repair rental strategies into the operations, the return on investment for it, how do we enable the shift internally, engage consumers on it, um, similar vein, how are tech platforms and, and um, websites like Loan Hood engaging consumers, and what is the role of organizations like Circle Economy in making this happen um, in practice and scaling it. So today we're joined by Jade McSorley, co-founder of Lone Hood, uh, Gwen Cunningham, lead textiles program at Circle Economy, and Madeline Michelle, social conscience communications officer at Toast. I cannot speak today, which is not great. Um, and I sort of have questions to the audience. I'm happy to fill in the hour. Um, but the whole beauty of joining a webinar live is that all of you joining us sort of the 170 people joining us live for this. This is your opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, what sort of challenges are you facing um, internally at your organizations as professionals in the space? So please do ask your questions. Don't leave it until the end. Um, there's also, so you can ask it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. And there's a fancy upvoting system. So if you think a question is interesting, upvote it. And um, it just means we'll get to it sooner. But that's enough for me. Um, Madeline, why don't I turn to you first? Um, tell us a bit about yourself and the platforms that you've been implementing at Toast. Um, sure. So um, I'm delighted to be here today from Toast. So thank you. Um, and at Toast, we've always sort of considered a slow and considered way of life. But in the last two to three years, we've really taken the time to reassess what it means to us um, as a response, um, what it means to us rather, what it means to us to be a responsible business. Um, and back in 2020, we published our roadmap setting out um, our immediate and long term social and, and environmental goals um, under kind of four broad um, categories, which is to enrich and educate, um, contribute through collaboration, cherish materials and minimize waste. Um, and the, our first um, annual report, which we published um, last month, um, really outlines our progress um, against the commitments that we made, um, the challenges that we faced and, and our, our upcoming next steps. But specifically in relation to circularity, um, we've been increasingly looking at um, circular principles to guide our approach to um, product design, materials and manufacture. Um, and our aim through our existing initiatives is really to foster longevity and support our customers and wider community to do the same. I think our broader hope is to reshape 
buying habits and advocate for quality and longevity, um, really shifting that thinking away from um, those who value novelty um, above durability. Um, and I think that as an industry, we need to get to a point where repair, um, rental and clothes swapping services um, are the norm and not um, just sort of a gimmick or a, a, a passing trend. And it's interesting, just some of those things you were saying just then, Tanya, um, because this whole the whole space, there's so much opportunity in it. Um, when you look to figures um, as well, things like um, the global fashion industry producing around 2.1 billion tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions, and but that supposedly we could reduce that um, by roughly 25% um, if we if we enabled circular models. And so um, I feel like it really is a no brainer to explore what's possible in that space. Um, it's obviously an ever evolving journey and one that's moving really quite quickly. Um, but it's definitely a positive and creative challenge that I think can deepen our connection as brands or as a brand um, from my perspective with our customers and then in turn encouraging them to deepen their own relationship with their clothing. Um, but every area of impact sort of needs to be considered um, carefully from supply chains and materials to water and energy use. But um, for me, circularity is really exciting because it's part of this sort of wider systems thinking and design thinking, um, which has seen increasing levels of innovation um, and each time with a wider perspective than before. And so in that sense, I think um, these strategies that um, brands and businesses like the ones that um, are here today provide sort of powerful tools when it comes to working out which of the solutions are scalable and, and which ones that we can innovate in. Um, but in terms of what the our key initiatives, which I sort of just touched on back in 2018 and 2019, we decided to kind of push this idea of longevity um, a little bit further. It's always been an integral part of what we do, but um, we wanted to really explore more ways of extending the life of garments, um, specifically through repair, um, and also looking at the life of clothing beyond its um, first wearer through swapping. So. Um, Toast Renewal is our free repair service, which is bringing new life to worn toast garments. And then Toast Circle is our clothes swapping initiative that really explores the use life of clothing um, by enabling people to connect through um, swapping their clothes. And while resale is definitely an exciting space, um, and we've really gained a good understanding of the appetite for pre-loved clothing um, through Circle in particular. Last year, we took the decision to prioritize um, repair and to scale that service in the first instance. The key message really being that we want to encourage people to extend the life of the clothing by repairing it um, and learning those skills themselves um, to really sort of build their own confidence in their abilities to look after their belongings, um, and online, our online content and events program have sort of explored mending, reuse and repair through a variety of lenses. Um, and our hope is that we're prompting discussion and encouraging the sharing of learnings among sort of groups and, and friends and family. So we'd sort of hosted a number of workshops at this point in our shops and we'd run um, a successful renewal pilot in our Notting Hill shop. And we really wanted to get behind this idea of um, knowledge sharing over novelty. And so last year we invested um, in a team of repair specialists to work out of um, six of our shop locations. We have 20 um, in total. And since then we've been able to repair um, over a thousand garments, um, which we're really excited about. It's 1,046 to be specific. Um, but alongside that, we've also increased our digital um, and virtual offering um, a lot in the last few years, I guess, like a lot of brands have done because of the situation we've been in. Um, but it's really allowed us to connect with our wider community and enrich the digital experience by learning and doing. And so we've had more than 6,000 people um, globally taking part in one of our virtual repair workshops, um, which is really helping us to kind of spread that, that message. Um, but essentially customers can bring um, any toast clothing item in need of repair into one of our shops and discuss the mending options with um, a toast shop colleague, whether that's one of the specialists themselves or, or just one of them in the shop, they're all trained to be able to share what's available. So visible and invisible mending, um, sashiko repair, darning, patching and applique are all the kind of the key things that we um, really champion. Um, 
but it's interesting, I think, because when it comes to rental and real resale models, I think you could argue that in a sense, they still sort of perpetuate consumerism in a way. And this sort of cycle that oscillates between desire and disappointment as like the original love of, of the garment can quickly kind of um, fall away and sort of deteriorate. Um, but I think that what circular models and, and rental swapping res um, resell, what they do very well is um, satisfy these sort of non-material needs um, that we have, like identity, participation, um, recreation and freedom. And I think that those are some of the things that, that it sort of really brings to the table. So through Toast Circle, which we launched in 2019, oh, the response has been um, brilliant and we've helped our customers swap um, more than 1,500 garments. Um, we keep a tracker um, of all the garments that come in and all the garments that go out, um, which has been super useful to be able to gauge the kind of the interest that we've had. Um, we have five permanent locations for Circle and we've got three more um, launching um, in April this year um, and that was following the success of some swapping week weekends that we ran um, throughout last year um, and that was really with the aim of connecting our local communities but um, the way that that kind of initiative functions is that you can bring up to five garments per um, visit into any toe shop um, and then you can complete a story um, label which details how and where you wore the garment because this this story element is really kind of integral to, to what we're doing. Um, and then you receive a token in exchange for each of the garments, which reflects the um, original value. Um, but we're currently reviewing our learnings because we we haven't kind of reviewed the um, initiative since we launched it. So we're before we relaunch again, we're looking back at what's worked really well, what we've learned that maybe doesn't work so well, so that when we launch again in April, we've got a really clear kind of vision for where we want to take it. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a, a summary. I don't want to keep going on too long. No, sounds great. Thanks, Madeline. I would love to hear more about getting people and consumers excited about repair. That can't be an easy task. Um, so how did you engage consumers in that? What sort of communication devices worked best in, in wanting them to come with their products and, and take time out of their day and, and learn these sort of skills, which are incredibly important? Mm. I think that the, the sort of the visual um, element is, is really important. Um, so, through lots of photography and through our Toast magazine online. Um, we kind of sharing through that and our social platforms, but I'd say that, I would say that the workshops have just been without a doubt, kind of the best way to en engage people. Um, I think that there was obviously um, a load of time where people were wanting something to do and something to learn and to distract from some of the things that have happened in the last couple of years. And so that really played into, um, kind of an opportunity for people to connect and realizing that there was, um, you could do something great, but also um, something great for the environment, but also something great for yourself. And so that was a really great way of, um, I think communicating it is to get people actually doing it themselves. Yeah, great. And I can imagine, you know, internally telling the management, we're going to make people repair their clothing and we're going to have them help them swap it both which lead to less you know probably sales how did you get that internal buy-in how did they you know what was sort of the mindset um of what convinced um internally teams to want to get engaged in these types of projects mm. well i think luckily we we work with teams who are um, all really passionate in general about this this topic and really keen to make a change. So I wouldn't say that we necessarily had an issue with buy-in or backing with these initiatives. They really did come from, um, um, from yeah, I, I think it was backing from the get-go, to be honest. But I would say that a, a challenge is maybe um, just maintaining the momentum. I think that um, it's there are other business critical things that can sometimes take over or perhaps um, get in the way. And so um, it's just about ensuring that some of these things that maybe started on the periphery really um, become embedded and, and central to what we're sort of doing. So I think um, while buying can be difficult, we I, I do think we're in a lucky position to get it from the get-go. Yeah, great. And I'm actually just looking at the Q&A and I saw Laura 
um, Carl Salman asked something similar to what I just did, so that's great. Um, I wanted to just also remind people that they can ask questions through through the Q&A function. Um, but I want to turn to you, Gwen, next. Um, with Circle Economy and Switching Gear Platform, you've done some great work in this area and specifically worked with brands on it. Um, so I'd love to hear from you sort of as a middle person having an overview of sort of the different actors what do you see as one of the interesting you know some of the interesting parts that are coming out of um your work in this area and also would be interesting to hear sort of the challenges that you see that brands are facing um on these sort of topics over to you yeah sure and yeah well first of all great to be here and uh with such a, a great panel um so maybe just a little bit first about the work that we do at circle for those who don't know and um, we're an impact organization based out of amsterdam but working globally and primarily we work with cities with businesses and with nations to help them in the practical implementation of the circular economy um i lead the textiles program my own background is in design and our mission has always kind of been the same since we were founded back in 2014, which is really trying to ask the question, you know, how do we achieve a zero waste industry? And we tackle that through two kind of distinct um, avenues. So on one hand, we're thinking about the existing waste in the system and how do you build the data, the technology, the infrastructure to valorize that at scale. And on the other hand, we look at how do you reduce you know waste in the or, or prevent waste sorry in the first instance which of course leads you to work with brands and manufacturers retailers people who make product um, and there all of our work is focused around you know helping companies to assess and adopt circular design and circular business models so you know this topic of circular business models really came on our radar i would say around about 2017 we saw that there was this huge um, interest kind of bubbling below the surface, especially from the brands that we were working with, um, but also a lot of trepidation. People kind of were understanding why it was needed, but I think struggling with how to do it in practice. Um, and we kicked off a project called Switching Gear, which ran from 2018 to 2021. It just finished uh, in December of last year. And Switching Gear was really trying to, um, I suppose, support brands um, to make that transition and to really try to kind of trigger the uptake of these circular business models in the market. So what we did was we selected um, four different uh, apparel brands, each of them very different in market size, you know, product, etc. Um, and we brought them on what we called a circular innovation process over 18 months. So this was really a, a process that moved them from the moment that they had the interest or intention to start a circular business model right through to then having a pilot ready and launched uh, in the market. Um, so that was Lindex, uh, Asket, Kuichi and uh, ETP. Then what we did after that, after the, let's say the, the pilot launch was also take a look at, okay, what have we learned from going through this, you know, in-depth um, process with these brands and how can we scale it so that any brand around the world can follow in their footsteps and can do this without our support. So we took that circular innovation process and we built what we call the circular toolbox. Um, and that toolbox is essentially kind of a step-by-step -step guide um, that helps any brand to um, design and launch a rental or a resale pilot. Um, and it's available, open source, free to use. Uh, it's got five distinct kind of modules that you follow um, in order, in consecutive order. And each module um, has a series of really tools and guides within it. So there's about 30 tools in total uh, in there. Um, and if anyone's interested, you can find it at www.thecirculartoolbox.com. I suppose some of the key learnings that we had along the way um, and there were many, um, but just to call out maybe a few, one was we saw that many brands who want to step into the space feel like it's um, that there's maybe a one size that fits all. You know, they look to the examples that are in the market. They see maybe peers of theirs who are already in this space and they say, let me copy paste and borrow that for my purposes. But I think that's really uh, not the way to go about it. I think you have to build your circular business model to really 
um, fit with your brand values, with your uh, consumer, with your, you know, your product, et cetera, et cetera. And I think actually, uh, Madeline, you're a great example of that. What you just described is so unique to Toast and what you guys are about. But in order to build something which is so bespoke and unique to you, you know, that takes a lot of work. So we saw that the need in the early kind of stages of your um, business model development to really engage with your customer, to understand their needs, their pain points, that is really crucial to developing a model that's fit for purpose. So we have a whole uh, module in our toolbox, which is just about understanding your customer and your market and ways to do that. Um, another, another insight, I suppose, would be that I see that brands feel a lot of pressure to maybe build these models out themselves and to already have all of the internal skills and capabilities. Um, and that can obviously seem like a huge undertaking because you're extending your supply chain in a way that you never had before. You perhaps never thought beyond kind of the point of sale. Um, and I suppose, you know, what you need to recognize is that there are such a host of solution providers, innovators out there, you know, like Lonehood, like others who are able to come in, step in and provide that service and be that partner who takes on those operations or who provides that expertise. So I think understanding where you need support and partnership and how to find the relevant people is really critical uh, to success as well. Interestingly, though, all of the brands that we worked with through the Switching Gear project first chose to do it themselves, because I think when you do it yourself, you really see firsthand where you need the support. Uh, Madeline, you kind of spoke to that, you know, and um, when you're, for instance, Lindex, they decided in their prototyping phase, they were going to process all the product uh, themselves that they were taking back. And in doing that, they got insights that they just never would have gotten if they had been already, you know, depending on a partner. So, for instance, they, you know, our uh, team at Lindex spoke quite openly about the fact that during that prototype phase, they would see customers in the store smelling the garments before they decided, do I want to purchase a secondhand garment? And that is such a key, key insight that then can help you to understand really the kind of needs and wishes of this customer and you know, you know what they value is important obviously cleanliness etc and that helps you then to fine-tune your your model so that would maybe lead me to a third um learning is the real need for prototyping and um, continuous iterative prototyping before you expect to have you know a fully operational scale of model um, and the purpose of prototyping is always just to gather data raw live data um, and to learn um, and I think you should always build in quite some prototyping in your business model development I'll keep it uh, at that because um, I don't want to go on too long no, thank you very much. Like, this is a really good um, overview of everything. And there's a lot to unpack and there's a lot of questions that um, I'd love to turn to you afterwards when they're coming through in the Q&A. Um, but I want to bring Jade in at this point as well um, as sort of the, the tech provider or tech platform on this topic area. Um, it'd be great to, you know, introduce the audience if they haven't heard about Lonehood already and sort of what are you, what were your objectives with the company and um, I'd love to hear also more how you're working, how you're engaging with consumers and communicating with consumers, because you probably have one of the most direct accesses um, in addition to Madeline. Um, it'd be great to hear from you on those points as well. No, oh, great. Hi, um, I'm Jo McSolly. I'm one of the co-founders of Lone Hood. And yes, thanks for having me on this amazing panel. I actually listen to you, Gwen. It's really interesting for us because we are obviously a startup. So, you know, we are constantly iterating and like changing the way we adapt and constantly questioning ourselves um, going forward. Even though we have a, a tech platform there, we constantly have to change. So we are we are Lonehood basically, and we're a peer-to-peer -peer fashion rental um, community as we like to call it. We are an app, but it's kind of giving, giving our users that kind of empowerment to kind of control their own wardrobes and be less of passive consumers and more active um, in the way that they they consume or think about consumption. Um, I mean, the, the kind of one of the obviously sustainability is, is one of our key like ethos and our values. But 
what we what we really want to do at Learnhood is take rental as a mainstream much like Madeline said we want it to be the norm want it to be something that think people think about before they go and buy something new and it's not a, an effort to think about it. it's just something that comes consciously to them and the, w the way that we do this is I mean gosh there's so many different ways obviously like listening to the consumers and what they want but also looking at how how consumption is now and how consumers work now and not trying to do something so different to what they're used to trying to kind of find something that is familiar and they're you know the social network side of our app for instance they're familiar with that um and also just like looking at what we know as co-founders we're all from the the fashion industry and we've worked in it for a long time and again it was instead of kind of you know trying to create something from scratch that was totally brand new it was like what have we witnessed within the industry? What are the skills that we have? And how can we kind of turn in them on their head a little bit? And obviously, you know, well, when you're, I, I was a fashion model before and I could see on shoots that people were renting anyway through stylists and PRs and, you know, influencers, they were all kind of doing this. So it was kind of like, why isn't everybody doing this this is such a, a great way to kind of share our wardrobes and kind of get that fashion fix but also try and fix in fashion at the same time because what we were seeing from consumers it was this kind of juxtaposition with the way that people you know they want to be more sustainable but they still want to engage with fashion and they still want to love fashion so what could we do that kind of joint those two kind of mindsets together um, so, so we have the, the obviously the peer to peer fashion rental app, and we kind of try to get people to look at the wardrobes, look at what they have already, and try and find the value of it. Um, which is 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 it's been challenging to be honest. When we first started, it wasn't like we started a business that was just about um, you know a single transaction it was about shifting behaviors so we had to think about ways that we could bring the consumers on board this journey with us um so we started off doing like clothes swaps much like what madeline was saying with toast and we have a a, a contract with hackney council so we do these community clothes swaps that are free and they're accessible and they show a a really accessible way for people to be sustainable you don't need to have a, a designer wardrobe in order to rent clothes and again this was like one of the things that we were realizing is that rental is great but it feels like you have to have this really high-end designer wardrobe in order to kind of to join it and we heard no like sustainable fashion should be accessible to all obviously it starts with clothes swaps, but how can we bring that into the rental space also so we instead of just renting an item we also then looked at renting a look like an entire outfit styling two pieces together because we are gen z focused um this is great for us because gen z have got this kind of creativity kind of embedded within them they're, they're the upcyclists the independent creators they're knitting they're really trying to find all these you know crafty ways of doing stuff probably propelled by the pandemic really so it's kind of you know renting their style and their enthusiasm for fashion rather than just renting these high-end items um and seeing what they want as well what do they want on the app you know what do they want to see do they want to see designers or do they want to see you know these independent creators that are creating stuff in their bedrooms um which is the really exciting part um but yeah there's there's so many other avenues i'll kind of sum it up there for now until we but there's so many other ways of, um, that I could answer this question. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> Great, thank you, Jade. Um, I'd be interested to also to hear, have you been working with brands or companies in this area at all? Um, and so could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, we do. I mean, obviously as we started, it was peer to peer. So it was kind of giving consumers specifically that chance to kind of open up their wardrobes. Um, but what we realize is that, you know, there's the big brands, yes, they're there to target, but we, we want the small independent brands, we, you know, that's the ones that we're looking at, the vintage shops, the the independent designers, the in, you know, those type of people that are kind of 
sustainability is actually part of what they're doing already. So they kind of already get the idea of rental anyway, you know, um, and showing how sustainability doesn't need to be so so restrictive and like limit you it can also open up this opportunity to be super creative and this is what these smaller brands are doing so it's much more inspirational we feel um but you know the platform is there it's open for everyone it's trying to show that actually rental can be as inclusive and as diverse as any as possible so you can use it in any way you want really mm -hmm. kind of like a depot meets airbnb is kind of like how we see it <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, we've heard a lot about uh, swapping, um, rental, repair, um, sort of the one that I'd love to bring into the conversation as well is the resale aspect. Um, and um, Gwen, I think you have dealt with uh, resale a lot and Madeline Jane, if you have anything to contribute at this point, please do. But um, obviously, and I think that this is also a question from from Sid in the in the conversation. There's huge problems um, internally to deal with resale, and one of the big ones is sort of you know uh, sorting and the internal capacity. But I'd love to hear from you, Gwen. Um, uh, tell us a bit more about how brands have been implementing resale, and um, Sid mentions the role of AI. And if you have any inputs on that, um, that'd be great as well. Yeah, sure. I do think resale, you know, if you look at kind of the market um, statistics, it, it's in many ways one of the most promising in terms of the, the growth that it's seen um, recently, which I'm sure, you know, people on this call are probably generally aware of, but it is, I think, uh, set to um, double in value by, by 2023. It's prediction saying that it's going to, you know, secondhand and resale in particular is going to start um, outpacing fast fashion within the next 10 years and so it is a huge market um, now I suppose one of the key things with resale of course is that especially brand-led resale of course is that you are uh, taking back your own product you're renewing it and you're reselling it uh, oftentimes alongside your your primary product um, and there are yeah there are challenges that come with that I think one of the first challenges is really that you are very dependent on your customer or your consumer as your supplier in this new model. And contrary to what you might see sometimes um, reported, for instance, the charity shop sector often have a, an issue whereby they have more um, kind of dropping rather than shopping. You know, people bring back things to a charity shop, but they may not tend to buy from the charity shop. What we're seeing with brand-led resale is oftentimes kind of the opposite, where there's a lot of shopping and not as much dropping. For many of the brands that we were working with, they really started to have a supply issue. Um, so how do you really engage your consumers so that they are not only bringing back kind of the volume that you need in order to support your business model and your business case, but also, you know, oftentimes the... Um, you have a certain kind of feedstock or supply uh, specification that you want to hit. You know, not every brand wants to um, give the option for the customer to bring back all brands, for instance, or all product types, or perhaps you know that you need it to be a certain quality in order for it to be feasible for you to, um, to renew it and to resell it. So the supply relationship is really important and the supply criteria that you set are really important to the overall success of your model. Another challenge with resale, um, and I think this applies, of course, to rental as well, is really ensuring that it does what it says on the tin you know the beauty of these models and the reason why we're all so excited on this call about them is because they have such a promise um in terms of kind of the the way that they can have a reduced environmental impact you know that extending the life of a product is one of the most effective ways to reduce the overall impact of the industry because it's reducing the amount of waste because it's hopefully incentivizing circular design and crucially, because it is hopefully displacing the need for new uh, production and new consumption. Now, those first two are relatively easy to prove. Um, you know, you can you can see if you're reducing waste. You can see if your design um, is changing because of this new business model. Mm -hmm. But how do you actually prove that you're displacing uh, the need for new production, new consumption? 
so with resale and rental, we uh, see that there's kind of two key metrics that you have to keep in mind. One is around the displacement, the rate of displacement, and two is around the utilization. So is the garment actually being used more and for longer? And those are unfortunately very hard to really get good data on. Um, in order for you as a brand to really be able to prove that ideally you are actually collecting that information direct from your consumer. Um, and as you can imagine, that's quite a task to start asking your cons consumer, you know, since you bought that secondhand product from me, can you confirm that you didn't buy a first-hand product elsewhere, etc. Now, there are some really good kind of guidelines emerging on that. I'd encourage anyone listening to look up RAP and WRI and their uh, reports that they released last year called Square Your Circle. Um, but oftentimes what we see in this kind of transitional phase before we have the metrics, before we have the means of measurement, mm -hmm. is that brands are also um, kind of extrapolating based on industry statistics that we know. So, for instance, you mentioned, um, Tanya, that statistic at the start of the hour about, I think, nine month extension equals 20 to 30 percent reduction. These are really useful, of course, because you can use those and kind of make sense of your model according to what these industry statistics already tell us. But there, what I would say is it's just really important to understand that those statistics are also built on assumptions. So you need to understand what are the assumptions underlying uh, those numbers. For instance, I think with that statistic, um, if I remember correctly, they're assuming a 60% displacement rate. You know, so getting kind of deep into the numbers and trying to prove um, and measure the validity of your model from an impact standpoint, I think is really crucial. If you want to build a resale model that has kind of a net positive impact. Um, and there, I would also say that don't forget about the social impact as well. You know, we mentioned before, you're building out an entirely new supply chain, which means new jobs, people. So think about, you know, the quality of work, um, all of these things need to also be built in from the outset to your new business model. Mm. Just on, on that last point, Gwen, um, Elena was asking exactly something on that, sort of assessing the social impacts of moving to um, circular uh, models. So if you could just you know, give us a little bit more um, on that, that'd be great. Yeah, I think it's, it's very emergent. Um, kind of the level of awareness and discussion and research around this topic. Um, we conducted work last year, for instance, it was called uh, measuring the, the risks and blind spots of circular business models. Um, and really looking, I suppose, at, you know, how could, if we're not careful, how could circular business models repeat or maybe even amplify some of the social issues that we already have in the linear supply mm -hmm. chain? You know, we know of stories from Uber, et cetera, you know, just because it's a sharing economy, just because it's a circular economy does not necessarily mean that it's better. Um, so we have a tool on the on the toolbox as well that helps you kind of do a quick assessment of the social impact of your model. Um, and it's everything, you know, from gender to inclusivity to quality of work, uh, et cetera, that you have to consider. Great, thank you. And you touched a little bit on data, and I can imagine, you know, getting that sort of data on where you, where number and um, those sort of pointers from consumers must be incredibly difficult. And there's been a lot of questions on data um, from from the attendees here. Um, but before moving into those, I'd love to just kind of frame the discussion a little bit more on circularity, just because a lot of the questions center around that. Um, so, Madeline, may turn to you first. Um, in addition to these programs that you're implementing at TOES, are you also implementing other circular business models? Um, are you designing for circularity, taking into consideration, you know, the, the choice of materials or, you know, what happens at the end, not just, in, um, you know, can the garment be recycled at the end? Does TOEST um, work in this area? And if so, um, how? And just to tag on to that, there's a question from Ling on this. And how have the repair, resale and reuse um, programs, or in this case, repair and, and reuse uh, programs impacted or changed TOAST's um, existing business models and um, operational models? Sure. Um, so 
yeah, I mean, Renewal and Circle are, are just two um, initiatives that we've implemented um, over the last couple of years. And more broadly, um, we have, like, alongside doing these kind of customer-based um, initiatives, we have also um, looking at our collections and what we're producing. We've scaled back our collections to reduce our waste, so produ producing 20% fewer styles. Um, and we're now producing just three drops per season, um, which is down from six just two years ago. So we're definitely um, thinking more broadly about reducing impact. Um, we've done kind of those things. Um, in terms of um, <clears throat> uh, designing for circularity, that's a, that's a, a really exciting um, area for us. It's something that we've kind of, we've implemented in a, in a small way um, so far, but it's definitely, um, actually, our top three priorities for this year, um, circularity um, is one of them. And within that very broad term, obviously, um, designing for circularity and specifically training our teams, um, design teams, but also not just the designers. It's it's um, everyone that is um, in that um, participates in the creation of a garment. So product developers. Um, as well and and everyone um within that journey it's important that they also understand the benefits of um designing for circularity because it is um to be honest a new a new area specifically designing for circularity um for toast so um we're excited to learn more about that and see um how we can alongside some of these initiatives that we are finding real success in um we are finding other ways that we can also increase our circularity can I add a, just a talk to that? Because I think one of the lesser kind of um, spoken about potential benefits of these circular business models is the feedback loop that they create on circular design in the sense that you're going to see this product back. So you actually are getting invaluable data and, and insight on how it performed and where it failed and how it can be better. Um, you know, especially with rental uh, that applies and, um, of course, with rental, you're also seeing, you know, just in terms of aesthetics and uh, consumer interest, what is rented for how long, you know, all of these things are really key data points that ordinarily brands have very little understanding of beyond the point of sale. So how as a brand can you also kind of build in systems to track that and to feed that back to your design teams. I think we're at, at a very early stage of making that link explicitly between the business model and the design. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting how much, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, just to add to that as well, um, obviously we work a lot with, with students and we do like a lot of kind of workshops, just kind of trying to change um, like consumer behavior and mindsets and we do workshops that are specifically de designed for rental so fashion design students that are sat looking at how to design things like just changing the way that they're actually who they're designing for and why they're designing and what is it and it's really interesting when you get students and obviously they're kind of concepts you know they're they're nothing anything tangible yet but there was a question in the chat saying what you've seen beyond swap repair but you could definitely see this evolving into kind of a new way Way of, of, of design that kind of is more circular that's for longevity and that kind of can be rented for diversity um, um and just yeah it's just really interesting yeah exactly um and maybe Gwen if you there's a question from from David on um sort of the metrics that uh should be included in circularity and Madeline if, or you know Jade if you have anything additional to add there but what Gwen from what you from working with brands what do you see as the main points um that are being incorporated into the measurement and trying to give impact and data to uh circular business models yeah I I think what we're seeing and I saw a comment um somewhere in the chat again about that um is really I suppose the um the resistance or not to having this new business model eventually um, compete with or eventually displace <clears throat> your primary business model. Um, and what was wonderful with the brands that we worked with, you know, by the end of the 18 months, 
that had really become the goal. <laughs> like, yes, that's why we do this, because we want to displace the primary business model. And then to start setting targets around that, um, like what you've uh, described, Madeline. I think other, you know, metrics and targets you can set is obviously around the number of, of the amount of product that you're taking back and um, the amount of product that you're renewing and reselling, because I suppose another unspoken truth about these models is that not everything that comes back will be suitable um, for uh, resale or or for rental. You know, every rental service has retired stock eventually. Every resale um, program has retired stock eventually. So we will always have textile waste in the system to a degree. And how do you also build eventually a non rewearable strategy as well um, for that eventual waste stream? So all of these these types of um, issues come to the fore. Just on that note, what I've seen. Um, in the past year, and it's very encouraging, is a lot more interaction between these different loops. So partnerships between resale providers and rental providers, for instance. You know, we saw, I think it was Hoor and Depop, where the retired stock from Hoor then gets sold on the Depop platform. And there's great kind of very early stage, but examples of, of that kind of um, interconnectedness between all of these loops that are now quite separate. Um, which I think is really promising as well. Um, great, thank you. Madeline or Jay, did you want to say anything on that at this point? Uh, no, I mean, talking about maybe like data, um, obviously as a tech, a tech platform, data is is really important to us. And, and because we're new, it's kind of trying to find out, yes, what are the metrics that we need to be measuring from the get-go? Um, and it's stuff that we're, we've started and we're, we can only see it grow. And then we'll, we'll have that data that will be super useful to kind of show the industry, this is how it works. This is what we need to change and also what can be done better because essentially this is you know it's still quite emerging really and there's been a lot of there's always a lot of skepticism and a bit of backlash specifically about rental because that you have the reverse, reverse logistics and you're sending to and back etc and the dry cleaning element and these are the things that you know we really do need to consider and like how can we mitigate those kind of concerns and risks how can we make it better and we've looked at certain aspects so we, we try to make it really hyper local in our community so you don't have to deliver you can um pick up and drop off in person and how can that evolve and it kind of essentially using that data to help build this new infrastructure that will just make this kind of collaboration between these businesses and um, work better and, and make each one run a lot smoother as well I think it's just the beginning, essentially. Great. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add is just um, around metrics and, and kind of um, and data gathering. Um, I suppose one of the we like I said, we track kind of the, the clothing that comes in versus the clothing that goes out. And then in terms of our repair service, the number of garments we have repaired, as well as the number of um, customers that have brought in the garments because it might be that sometimes um customers will bring in a couple of pair of, a couple of um, garments to be repaired um or they might um so they might use the service over and over and so um we're looking at all sorts of different things in that sense and then um also kind of um the more um qualitative data I suppose that's really gathered by our teams in our stores there's a constant kind of stream of communication in that sense hearing um, the engagement that we're having the, the stories and the the conversations that are being had because I do think for us we really do feel that there's nothing quite like a conversation when it comes to some of these topics and I think that um, it can just um, take um, overhearing a conversation in a shop about what's going on between that exchange to get you to get involved in what's in in that service so I think um, the the um i can't think of the word but the the kind of ad hoc um data collecting is also really important as well as the numbers i think um that um it takes a bit longer to sift through of course but it, it kind of it gives you a a clear direction um i think as well yeah exactly um i mean you've kind of touched just on this madeline so thank you for the great pivot but kind of kind of going back to engaging consumers and again there have been quite a few questions about 
um, telling the story and and those sort of um, topics. But I just want to turn to you first, um, Jade. There's a question from Rebecca on how do you how do you communicate with um, consumers or you know your clients, your um, the people on your app around sort of the uh, practices of the unsustainable practices in the fashion industry. Um, do you communicate with them on this? Is this a point or, you know, what's sort of the, the benefit that you're um, advertising to potential people working um, on your platform? Yeah, I think I message. I, I think I sent a message, but I basically say we need to make it cooler than but going to buy fast fashion. Like, you know, we need to make it just seem a lot more exciting and cooler to be involved in. And that's what we're trying to do. And, and, what we realized is that we already have like a core community of those people that are really sustainably minded that they're on the journey with us and and we want we're excited to have them on board and, but we're still how do we communicate that to the people who are still you know shopping fast fashion and sustainability might not be something that's kind of passed through their thought process and it's kind of communicating that to them so it's kind of you know like I was saying before it's kind of bringing the familiar to them like not presenting something that's so different it still looks cool it still looks like in the same vein as like you know how those fashion campaigns are portrayed but then highlighting the benefits of that like you know you can make money from your wardrobe you can still go out and get have to wear something new to you you know like or um dress like your style icon, dress like this influencer, you know? So it's kind of tapping into what people want and why why are they consuming so much? But then just saying, okay, there's an alternative way to get it. It doesn't have to be go down to the shop on a Saturday and, you know, buy it. So it's just looking at, yeah, just looking at what they're actually doing now and then kind of reacting to it in our own way. Yeah. Can I Great. can I add to yeah, that? Because yeah. I find this topic so um interesting. And I think what, what you just described, Jade, is like the, the absolute perfect approach for what you also told us earlier is your target customer, you know, of this this Gen Z um type. And I think what we see um is that you know the pitfall, I suppose, with communication around sustainability is that it tends to assume that people will engage because it is a sustainable option and we know I think by now that that's really not necessarily the case for some of course it is but you know we have to kind of swap from asking you know what can you do for sustainability towards more of a, a mindset of what can sustainability do for you what are the emotional social functional benefits that it will bring you personally beyond just the feel-good factor and that will really vary according to who you're trying to reach, you know, and we were working with, uh, for instance, Lindex, to use them as an example, we were building their resale model around um, kids wear. So we need parents to bring back, you know, the goods. And so the, the messaging was very particular to a parent and what are their kind of needs and pain points, which at the end of the day was really about convenience. Um, and the fact that they've got this wardrobe that's over full and they want a little bit more space in their lives. So I think building um, the communications campaign around the specifics of your of your target audience um, is really crucial. And again, there's some tools on the toolbox that really uh, tell you how to do that in practice. So um, there is no one size fits all model, I suppose, is, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and also yeah, every consumer will have come with different, you know, um, aims. And like you mentioned, Jade, some of them, you know, it's just about saving money or making money. Um, you know, you're going to five weddings this year. It's said just, you know, come to this platform and others. It could be, look how much your footprint could decrease by X amount if you join this. And it's just trying to target each of those um, separately and understanding your own consumer. Um Madeline, there was a question from Andre, and just kind of going back to you mentioned creating that story with the um, with the swapping. Um, we touched on it a little bit, but could you, you know, we just have a few more minutes, but kind of um, illustrate sort of that story that you illustrated to to con potential consumers, and um, you know, get them to 
uh, engaged in the swapping, but then also kind of tying it to Chloe's question about um, kind of bringing consumers through the story of garments and attaching them to, you know, what has gone into it, the craftsmanship, the fiber, the resources, the raw materials. How do we communicate that um, in a way that's digestible and interesting to consumers? Sure, I think, um, so let me just think where I should start that. Um, I think that um, in terms of communicating um, for us a really useful um, tools around craftsmanship and the way that our garments are produced, we've, um, like online, we use our, our Toast magazine and through our social platforms, we find that that's really helpful. In, in the last couple of years, our kind of we have our, uh, a time to make series, which is something that exists on our um, on our social platforms. And these are these kind of short, but very insightful and engaging videos about um, how certain products are made or the inspiration behind certain products. And that really serves as a vehicle to kind of connect the consumer with with that item or that object to make to understand the process from sort of start to finish. I'd say that's um, been a really useful tool for us in that in that initial engagement in the product itself and then in terms of engaging with the um, with the circularity and, and the, uh, the sharing of garments and the stories um, they when we first launched the initiative um, the Toast Surf initiative we had um, we um, hosted co um, conversations or talks um, with people just to share um, <clears throat> not just the not just the environmental benefit of of um, extending the use life of clothing, but also that social element and the ability to come along and and actually meet people in person. Obviously, that was much harder during um, these past couple of years. But when we first launched, there was real kind of appetite for connection. And I think that now, um, since being digital for such a long time, there's this renewed sense of of wanting to connect and and. Um, sort of doing that through clothing um, and specifically clothing that ha um, has been very beautifully made by um, by talented artisans. I think that that's, um, there's always a story for the kind, um, for the garments that you wear. I think that for a lot of people, especially people that love clothing and are interested in fashion, there's, um, there's usually a, um, a real reason for why they love it and memories attached to it. Um, I think that's an important element of the swapping and it goes back a bit to the quality um, thing as well. It's when you're sharing something, it's got to be something that you could imagine you would get almost um, give to a friend or, or give to a like you would want to share that with someone. So you want to make sure it is of a high quality. I don't know if I've actually answered that question at all. I feel like I've rambled on a bit, but um, I think that the stories are very important um, is the point I'm trying to make. And I think that um, if clothing can be really hard to part with as well, right? And I know that's something that we've said is that the bringing clothes, um, the kind of the stream of, of clothing that's coming in to be swapped um, or, or resold, um, sometimes people don't want to let go. So um, that's also a shift in thinking as well, that you can actually give your clothing a second life. And if you spin in the back of your wardrobe for a year, like why not let somebody else take the reins? <laughs> That's a huge thing when we're, we're speaking to vintage shops about that kind of seller's remorse. Mm. So rental is like, you know, in the mm. off, you know, swapping is another way to do that. I know we're running out of time, but I just wanted to add something that we've done with a, a project with Community uh, Couture where she created a garment made out of like 27 stories that are all hand stitched. And then through Lone Hood, we then rent it out in order to carry on that story with others and through the stories of renting out the jacket, she makes another piece. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting how the story can build the narrative of the jacket. And that's something that's new and created, but yeah, it's um, it just came to my mind to talk about it. Yeah, great. Thank you all. Yeah, I mean, I guess Nigel kind of puts it well as, as the last question, or maybe I'll, I'll pose it more to like a, a task for everyone joining, you know, just making sure that we're, when we're thinking of any of these business models to be taking the end garment into consideration, not creating a platform for consumers just to feel like, okay, if I buy this item, that's all right, because I'll find a way to, you know, resell it or something at this point that we're also just encouraging designing for circularity and consuming less and toast your idea of, you know, less, um, less um, uh, seasons and less, um, 
I'm forgetting the words already. Um, uh, bring uh, less, less clothing to the market. Collections mm -hmm. um, to the market um, is a great way to do it. But I just want to thank everyone for um, their great questions. If you want to, you know, keep the conversation going between each of you, um, please do. Between the panelists. We'll be discussing these topics and more at the Sustainable Apparel and Textiles Conference on the 26th to 28th of April virtually. Um, we also have a pre-conference workshop on the 10th of March. So check out our website to see how you can join that. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining and thank you very much to Madeline, Gwen and, and Jade um, for your time today and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.